and welcome to the Rob Call Bottom Up Show. It's available on Pacifica Radio Network, Progressive Radio Network, iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and the complete archives are available at opednews.com slash podcasts with an S where there are over 450 interviews. My guest for the show, and I'm really excited to have her on, uh, is Carol S. Pearson. She's an American author, educator, innovator, and consultant. She develops new theories and models with an applied practical bent built on the work of psychiatrist C.G. Young, psychoanalyst James Hillman, mythologist Joseph Campbell, and other depth psychologists. She is best known as the author of The Hero Within, Six Archetypes We Live By, followed by the more expansive Awakening the Heroes Within, 12 Archetypes to Help Us Find Ourselves and Transform Our World, and also Persephone Rising, Awakening the Heroine Within, and numerous books tying archetypes and Jungian psychology to business leadership and marketing. She also created the Pearson she co-created the Pearson Marr Archetype Indicator, the PMAI. Her new book, a brilliant new contribution to the understanding of story is What Stories Are You Living? Discover Your Archetypes, Transform Your Mind. Her website is www.carolspearson.com. Uh, one thing, and, and welcome, welcome so much to the show. It's great to Thank have you. Thank you. Great to be with you. <laughs> One thing that's fun about this book is it includes a free pass to take a test to identify your top three archetypes and your and 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 the order of, of all twelve of your archetypes and the, the top three and the bottom one are, are, are apparently the most important. Uh, and uh, it, it, you get a free test with the book and and if you want to take the test without buying the book, you can, but it costs more than it costs to buy either the print or the ebook. So uh, it, get the book. It's really worth it. So let's see. Let's start off with a story. Pick a story to tell us. Well, the last book I wrote before this one was, uh, <laughs> was Persephone Rising. And so uh, I, think, I think I'll talk about that because she was on my mind today. Um, uh, many people may know the story of Demeter and Persephone, um, but I know the real story. Uh, this isn't the this, this is the Pacifica radio story uh, of, of Persephone. I mean, here she is, you know, she's a little goddess and she's just doted upon by her mom and other goddesses. And she has a father at Zeus, but he's never around because uh, busy, he's busy being married to somebody else. And uh, she, um, she's just a happy little kid and, and she's very good because everybody's so nice to her all the time. She's a good, sweet girl. And she reaches the age of about 15, 16 and hormones are raging. And she's beginning to wonder about what else is out there in the world. And <clears throat> she's out there with her friends. And she walks off by herself and they're picking flowers and she sees this flower that's just the most gorgeous flower she's ever seen in her life. And she reaches over to pick it up. And this really handsome dude just appears out of the out of the crack in the in the earth and it's chariot and snaps her up and takes her down to the underworld. Now many people would know that that is Hades. That is the god of the underworld, and he is cute. But he's pretty scary. And you know there's that time when teenage girls like the bad boys? Well, there he is. He's like the archetype of the bad boy, taking her to this place. And she gets there, and she, um, she's kind of scared. And she looks around, and she said, what, what have you done? I, I waved at you, but I didn't mean you to take me away. And he says, well, your dad, Zeus, said I could marry you. And she says, where's the wedding? And she looks around and she sits there in the corner and she pouts. She's 16 or 15. What would she do? She pouts and looks really cross. Because I researched it, I know that in ancient Greece, 
when a woman who had had a, a girl who had had an arranged marriage um, <clears throat> uh, after the wedding, uh, they actually go to the groom's house, which is the house of his parents, and they usually have made a feast. And she looks around at the and decides if the accommodations are suitable to her. And the way that she says, I'll stay, is that she eats something. If she doesn't eat anything, they can contact her parents and see what would happen. But she has not said that she would stay. So Persephone looks around and she says, this is a dump. It's, it's creepy here. You know, it's kind of dark and awful. You're going to have to redecorate. <laughs> and um, and you're the Lord of the underworld, but you're not doing a very good job. Look at all these people. They're scared. They don't know what's happening to them. Here they are in this new life. And and uh, I'm going to have to tell you, if I'm going to be here, do you dare redecorate? I'm going to I'm going to help them so they're not scared about what's happening to them. You know, having your body sort of disappear and just becoming a soul is kind of a terrifying thing. So. <clears throat> Quite a while, this this uh, situation sort of keeps going on until, and of course, um, uh, you know, he's hoping to get some, but not until she eats anything. And uh, so, finally, she says, "You know, I, I'm getting to kind of like you, you know, um, Hades. So, you know, you're you're pretty handsome, and now you've done everything I wanted, and I'm." you know, I'm in charge of all these souls, so they're not scared anymore. And, and, uh, but you know, I'm a goddess of nature and the flowers. So I don't want to be here all the time. And, uh, you know, I miss my mom. I'm only 16. And he says, well, why don't you eat three uh, pomegranate seeds? And she says, okay. Well, meanwhile, as most people know, Demeter has been doing everything she can to get her daughter back. And she's won the war against uh, Zeus by, by creating a famine. And, um, and Zeus has said, okay, my, you know, you can have your daughter back. I give up. Well, Persephone, uh, he sends hey, uh, Hermes down and, and Hermes takes helps Persephone go back up and she sees her mom. And the minute she touches the earth, of course, flowers bloom and she hugs her mom. And remember, she's still 16. And her mom asks her what happened. And she's so happy to see her mom and to be in the upper world, which she missed so much. And she says, yeah, but I do have to go back. And her mom says, why? Oh, he tricked me. <laughs> um, oh, he tricks you. Well, ever since then, um, Persephone uh, um, goes to the underworld for the part of the year that she likes to be there, like the winter months when it's not so nice on the upper world. And she and her mom create the Eleusinian mysteries where they initiate all the living people into not fearing death anymore and being happy and knowing how to be happy. And then when she's in the underworld, she takes care of the, of the people and after they're dead, so they won't be scared. And a new religion, a mystery tradition, um, includes the idea that we must die before we die. And in that tradition, they practice incubation or they wrap people up like they were little babies and they had them in uh, caves or basements or places that are underground and dark to replicate being in Hades. And their task was to, um, was to have a vision where they met Persephone. So they would know never to be scared of dying. That it was all part of the natural cycle like seeds growing and being and flourishing and then being planted in the ground and growing again. And that's the end. That is a very classic story. 
Yes. And it's in the yeah. book too, in a, in a slightly different way. You know, what uh -huh. listening to it made, it made me think there must be a Bollywood version of this. Yeah, there with, should with be. Netflix. And if there isn't, you should write it. <laughs> <laughs> that would be fun. I'd love to do a movie. <laughs> yeah, really. I mean, it just, it just, because you made it so contemporary with the teenage girl, and it was great. That was well, she was a teenager. I mean, they were teenager girls back then getting married. And sure, yeah. <laughs> okay, so wow, that was that was a, a, a great story, and 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 such an important one. And everybody should know the story of Persephone, really. And mm -hmm. uh, you've got a whole the book uh, poster behind you. You wrote a whole book about it, Awakening the Heroine Within. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. So, the next question I have for you is: Can you talk about your life's work? What your goals have been? What you see as your most significant accomplishments? This, I mean, this book is really a culmination of an awful lot of that. But tell us what what has been your life's work? Well, I certainly haven't been a person who started out knowing that I had a life's work. Uh, you know, just to, uh, I started out realizing that I really needed to go to college. <laughs> you know, that, that there was something I needed to do. <laughs> um, uh, and I didn't, I, I really didn't know what it was until I had been preparing to be a high school teacher. My mom was a kindergarten teacher. I was growing up in Houston, Texas. So, um, and the women's movement hadn't quite hit there. Uh, so I, and, but I went to graduate school at Rice University and a um, miracle happened. Uh, there's a lot of miracles in my life. They taught literature from the point of view of uh, deaf psychology. And so I was reading Jung and Campbell, and, you know, uh, all of the greats on that and learning about that in literature. And, uh, uh, and then uh, from there, uh, I, I actually moved into, I got, I got a job at the University of Colorado teaching. And my goal there was basically feminist. I mean, I was, I wanted to change the world and still do um, uh, in, in the sense that, that I, even my, all of my work has actually had a theme about gender balance, gender partnership and equality and how we need the masculine and the feminine energy. We need them badly. And because of the history of patriarchy, um, what's missing often is the feminine. Um, but we also need the, the true masculine. Um, but I went from there and so I was, um, I was, I was an English professor and they asked me to run the women's studies program. Eureka. And I was running the women's studies program and that was fine. And I was supposed to be doing research on women and very feminist research on women and archetypes started talking to me. Literally, um, and I wasn't crazy. So <laughs> I was just doing a lot of Jungian stuff the way that that happens. And uh, so I- Were you writing? Well, you know, I was publishing or parish writing as a English professor. I had to write. But were you and writing about archetypes was... then? No, not yet. No. I was writing feminist analytical research papers <laughs> and, and literally the archetype started demanding that I write the hero then. They didn't tell me the title, but, and that's where this work started. I mean, it started with a series of, of outer events that were kind of serendipitous. And then this inner in an inner event that just called me to something different. And I kept saying, I'm not supposed to be doing that now. <laughs> and it was at that point that I knew that it was my work, but I didn't know the shape, what the shape of it was going to be. And it's developed kind of organically. Um, you know, I wrote 
I wrote uh, The Hero Within and it, it took off. I mean, there was no big publicist or anything. It took off and sold like crazy. I bought and, a copy. Uh, yeah. When was that? When, did you, when was that published? Uh, in, in the 80s, in the 80s, 1980s. It's an old book now. <laughs> still good though, uh, still current. Although there have been three editions, so maybe that helps with it. Um, and then I realized I started getting asked to speak a lot and do workshops and um, team building. And I realized the six archetypes that had been in that book were not enough. And it was at that point that I created Awakening the Heroes Within, which is really the 12 archetypal theory. And that was, I was trying to meld um, Erickson's work with Jung's work in terms of human development and the archetypes involved in that. And then that has, has I've done other things, but that has been central to everything I've done ever since. And the instrument that we have uh, now uh, has, gone through, has gone through so much research and development. It is now really good at, the, at telling people what archetypes are. Active. I've had, you know, analysts take it and they say, wow, that, that, that nailed me. <laughs> it's powerful. It was, yeah, I mean, it, it's it really great. is. <laughs> it's really incredible. But the, the, there's, there's simply been a lot of serendipity in my life and, and things have happened that, um, you know, I get a call from an advertising agency that they're, they're using my work and I say, you shouldn't be doing that <laughs> to promote your products. And, you know, this is not good. But then uh, Margaret Mark called from Younger Group Time and said, you better do something because they're doing it all over the place. So, um, so we wrote The Hero and the Outlaw about um, branding and authentic branding like Jung's idea of persona development. Um, so that, that authentic branding is really about connecting who you really are with, with an organization's authenticity, what it stands for, what it cares, what does it care about um, with, uh, with what the world is willing to pay to do and to shine, you know, and to, uh, appreciate them and understand that they're making a contribution. Um, and so that ended up being really interesting. And uh, basically um, in my work, what I'm trying to do is help people get conscious and help people, um, you know, I was raised to be a person who cares about the world and I was supposed to contribute and be nice to people <laughs> and caring and, um, I, I so believe in the archetypal work and how doing archetypal work can help people deepen and connect with, you know, connect with the, their deeper selves. And then also the potential is for one of the reasons I work a lot with organizations or have, I'm not doing, I'm doing less of that now. Um, and with even branding is, <laughs> We need our, all of our um, social institutions to wake up, you know, wake up in the sense of deepening and to get a grip. What happens when uh, social institutions wake up and deepen? Well, I think that, you know, we're just coming out of this pandemic, or I hope we are. And a lot of people are thinking about their lives and they're thinking <laughs> that they want something deeper and more fulfilling than what's been happening. And <clears throat> we're living in, we've been living in a consumerist uh, culture um, <clears throat> and one that's extremely unequal and um, racist, <laughs> um, but also where organizations like the corporations increasingly think it's all about profits. Not all of them, of course, there, there are some really good ones out there, but it's all about profits. Well, life isn't just all about profits. And, you know, money in the bank doesn't actually make us happy. I mean, using the money to do things we love or care for people or anything like that does. So what I think happens is, um, 
is, well, first of all, we have to start in our organizations as individuals. And this is the real bottom up, you know, the real bottom up is from each one of us, you know, being willing to say what we care about and what we believe in and what we really want to see. And I trust humanity enough to know that for people who've done any work on themselves and think about it, they want to be a decent person. No, they want to care about their family. They yeah. don't want to be polluting the environment. Uh, you know, there's, um, <clears throat> but waking up is also, if we think about what's going on in the political world, and it can for many become all about power. We can create a situation which is happening now when a whole segment of the population believes stuff that isn't true. No. And waking up is recognizing what's true. <laughs> In your book, you, you, you say that the way people get deeper is by going through heroic journeys. And mm -hmm. whatever their archetype is, with all kinds of different journeys, what does that look like for an organization? Well, that's an interesting question. Well, organizations have <clears throat> have lives, you know, and they have stages. <clears throat> Some of my work is a bit different than Campbell's on the hero's journey, because uh, although I was very much influenced by him and credit him for, I couldn't have done what I did without Campbell. Um, but uh, a lot of, I started out with a focus on literature and stories that are in literature and what's in the movies and what's in the novels and tells us a lot about our culture right now. And so I tried to do my, the hero's journey as I saw it was closer to ordinary life. And some of that was also because I wanted it to be, um, to be relevant to women as much as men and to um, populations that tend to be under, undervalued. Um, and not that Campbell's work isn't, but it's a bigger leap. Okay, but I asked and, you about organizations. How is the, what is it? Oh, I'm sneaking away from that. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> well, give me time to think. <laughs> Um, I think the first thing about the, uh, you can, uh, an organization could start a hero's journey by, look, you know, many organizations right now are coming up with their vision and their mission and things like that. And most of the time it's window dressing. But if they actually start looking and I created a, 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 I created an instrument that's now owned by IBM, so I don't use it, but they use it with big countries of uh, companies that look at the 12 archetypes that I work with in the culture and find out to look at what are the real values of the people here. And, and yeah, to do that, you can then have a, have a mission that's authentic to the people who are there. And that can be related to the brand, but it's not necessarily exactly the same. You can then create policies that fit that you can really think we say we're that we we say we're this we know that the people who are here have these kinds of values um how how does that affect the decision we make today and also um how do we do leadership development do we do leadership you know and um we need to do, to develop the leaders who can lead in, in this context. So you have a caregiver country, uh, company, you're wanting to be sure you're being caring. <laughs> um, and many companies, you know, that's a dangerous one to have because the expectations are high. I, I, I like that as, a, as one, but it's, people think it's easy to be caregiving, but then you do something uncaring and you're in real trouble. Uh, whereas if you're a revolutionary culture, <laughs> you get away with a lot. Um, nevertheless, what you can get away with is being boring, staid, um, just following the rules every minute. Um, and if, 
you know, and very typically you have a lot of ruler organizations that are full of bureau bureaucracy and uh, it all fits for them. But you can't, you have to be then true to what you say you are. And then there are those moments in, a, in an organization's life where it's not gonna work. You know, whatever it is that you get hit with something and you have to change, maybe not from your fundamental beliefs, but from a lot of what you do. And then the issue, like for any of us as individuals is how can I be true to who I am and be relevant to this situation? Um, I would imagine that companies go through an evolution as they go from startup to a more uh, sustained uh, culture and business. Like uh, sure. Apple, when Steve Jobs and, and, and Wozniak started it, is, is was not going to be the same as the Apple today. Right, right. And there's some question that they actually changed. I mean, they were a revolutionary. They're more care, care, uh, creator now. Um, but both were true of them. I mean, you, you want to have in an organization, you want to have all 12 archetypes, all of these 12 archetypes, because these archetypes are all related to being functional in the, in the world. Um, and um, so it's not that you want it to be one thing, but yes, there's, there will be some, it's just like growing up, you know, uh, um, growing up in, and life and, and, and awakening the heroes within. Um, I really talked about the, the innocent orphan caregiver and warriors being fundamental. You've got to kind of learn to trust the world, to, but also then to be heard and be resilient and get more realistic. You have to care for yourself and everybody else. You got to have some boundaries. And that's really early. And, um, uh, and quite different than what the core archetype is about your belief system and whatever, which probably early comes from your parents anyway. Okay, so we need to take a, a little break now for the show ID. And then we're going to come back and I'm going to read a couple of the things that you say to intro to the book. And then I want to get some basic definitions from you. So, okay, right. the video here. Okay, and my guest for the show is Carol Pearson. She is an author, educator, innovator, and consultant. She's developed new theories and models which have been applied with a practical bent, building on the work of uh, Jung and James Hillman and mythologist Joseph Campbell and other depth psychologists. And her, her best known work is Hero Within Six Archetypes We Live By. And her newest book is What Stories Are You Living? discover your archetypes, transform your life. And so I wanted to, I, I took some notes just to put some ideas down and, and I'll go, I'll throw them out and then uh, I'd like to get some definitions from you, okay? So you say, you say that archetypal and narrative intelligence are stories are, are, are essential. And that's stories are the human mind's most natural way of understanding ourselves and the world. And you refer to 12 archetypal stories, idealist, seeker, sage, realist, lover, jester, caregiver, ruler, creator, warrior, revolutionary, and magician. I took the test and I came out revolutionary, warrior, and sage were my top ones. And then my last one was realist. And I kind of see myself as, as an activist and I, I, I think it fit me great. You know, I, I repeat, People always tell me, you got to deal with reality. And I go, I'm going to fight it. <laughs> That's the status quo. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah. What was the second one? Because I got distracted by what your third one was. Um, oh, oh, it was, uh, so it was revolutionary, warrior, yeah. and then sage. Okay. Warrior and sage. Okay. Yeah. That's really helpful. <laughs> And, and, and so you say, once you know your own dominant archetypes, 
you can use that. And that's what this book is all about, really. Uh, can people figure out their archetypes without taking the test? Sure. Sure they can, particularly if they know something about archetypes. Also in the book, there are two different places where there are in-depth definitions of the archetypes. Oh, boy, there are chapters. And you can read them. <laughs> you can read them, and many people could do that. But um, so, yes, of course. And you can have three years of analysis, too. And you probably know. So I just maybe, want to read a little bit more from your intro. I want to read a little bit more from your intro, and, and okay. then, then we'll get yeah. into, into some more stuff. You say, if we're oblivious to the story patterns we're living, we can't shape the form they take. And we're all living more than one story. Uh, and it's you say it's in actually living your stories in real time that you gain their gifts. And you, you also call them treasure, too. And you and, and you, mm -hmm. refer, you refer to your archetypes as your treasure as well. Yeah. And, and you describe the 12 archetypal stories we live as superpowers and you refer to them as your treasure chest. So. And, and then one more thing, and then we'll, we'll, you can get into it. You say the brain selects new data according to pre-existing patterns in our heads, many of which take the form of the stories that we are unconsciously living. Reality becomes what fits these narratives. For this reason, the more we expand the stories we live, even virtually, the less we become locked into old thinking and behaving. So, so let's start off with some definitions, and then I'm going to go back to some of these things. So so what's an archetype what's a hero what's a hero's journey what's an archetype okay um an archetype uh is any can be any pattern or process um that um that can be observable consistently over time as having a a, a core motivation, a core sense of something. Um, uh, and the archetypes that I work with are parts of human, are connected to human consciousness. They're all archetypes that help us develop some capacity and, and not just us, the ancients, the early humans too, develop some kind of needed way of uh, of capacities, of superpowers, of uh, what we're good, superpower being what we're good at, what we, what is, we're distinctively good at. But, you know, so that the, there's a, an archetype will emerge very often as, as a um, motivation, a desire, a longing, um, and then it began, can be, begin to be lived in which I'm, you know, I'm living a lover story, just fell in love, you know, and wow, I'm an infatuated, I'm living that story, or I'm in love with a new uh, new work, I'm in love with a new place. I fell in love once with the Rocky Mountains. Um, and the these kinds of archetypes are also then about developing capacities, because it's one thing to fall in love. It's another thing to be married for 12, 46 years, <laughs> you know, or to fall in love with Jungian psychology and then do the work uh, in the world. Um, uh, I don't know. Did that define archetypes enough? Do you, do you think that was clear? Do you have a... Well, I think, you know, when I think of archetypes, I think of it's, it's a kind of a way that we live the world through. It's, it, it's a collection. <laughs> it's a way of seeing the world. And that that kind of organizes our behaviors. Yes, and and, and you characterize them as something that is not just something we learn or pick up. That that's really deep. Uh, I forget how it's put exactly, but it's something that's that's it, deep in us. It it, it, it I, how how did he describe it? Well, yeah. I mean, it comes out of the collective unconscious. Okay. The archetype is in the collective unconscious, and we connect with that through the deeper self okay. and through our authentic, the part of the deeper self that it's authentic, it's really authentic to us. And, uh, and so then that archetypal energy that's been, that you could find in any period of time in, in the things that people, that human beings, how they think, how they, what they do. <laughs> um, 
it emerges and it moves into consciousness and engages the ego in that process too. That's when the neuroscience comes in. You know, then it defines what we see, what we notice, and the stories that we tell. But at that point, at that point, um, the, the expression of the archetype is influenced by our experiences and the stories we've told, we've heard. So that the form of the archetype will be uh, affected by the culture we live in, the family we came from, um, and our experiences. Now, now, I have an interest in evolutionary aspects of this. Uh, one of the, mm -hmm. the folks who has most influenced me is Darsha Narvaez, who wrote the book, The Neurobiology of the uh, Development of Human Morality. And she looked at how indigenous people uh, function. And she, she projected from that how people function before civilization, which would mean 99% of human existence and how 99% of our genes and our psychophysiology and our emotional expression were all developed. And so my question is, how do you think it's different, if it is different, for indigenous people or and how it would have been different from before there was civilization with hierarchy and domination and, and centralization and things like that? Well, um, um, people lived in, I suspect, as from what we know, um, in situations of small clans and, and where survival was always at, at issue. And so um, the, you know, in terms of if there are things, if you didn't have, I don't know how you would have survived and many people didn't. If you didn't have any, if you couldn't be hopeful, you wouldn't have survived. If you couldn't have been um, realistic to some degree, you know, <laughs> you gotta know I could starve. <laughs> um, you know, they would have to have that. and. And between, you know, with the danger from animals and sometimes increasingly from other tribes, they needed their warrior. You One know, they the needed a warrior did, archetype, but it would be primal survival. What, what Narvaez said is that one huge difference was that people in these hunter-gatherer uh, bands of 30 to 80 people maybe, they had a consciousness of the needs of each other and of the environment, of how their behavior affected everybody else. And yeah, they had to. Yeah, what? Where would that fit? Yeah, they had to into the archetypal picture. I think it has a lot to do with how the archetypes are expressed, and it also has to do with right now we have a, a society where we tire, you know, and there's winners and losers and. And somebody's and nobody's, but you needed everybody. Yeah. Which means that if somebody had a superpower, this one needs to care. This one needs, to, this is good at healing. This is good at hunting or whatever. You had a sense of, of how important everybody was. Um, I, I remember reading too that one of the ways that Homo sapiens survived when some other human like ones didn't is they learned to care, they learned to uh, care for the ill, care for the people who are ill um, and care for one another. And, and yes, uh, um, and that's, that's something, you know, as have people have survived and moved into uh, these very large, our large cities and are, we're trying to develop a global consciousness it's much easier to have that sense of connectivity and expressing your archetypes humbly, needing everybody else in a small group. And even now we see that on people who, who, who can, can care about the people of their own skin color or their own country. Um, and you know, the evolutionary pull is to be able to, what ancient people, um, what ancient people learned to do together in small groups to be able to do it in large groups and in the world at large. 
I would imagine that in, in indigenous peoples, there's there might be a hunter archetype or a, a or a gatherer or somebody who knows uh, like natural wisdom. Uh, and, and I guess that could be the 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 pre pre writing version of the sage, maybe. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, the gatherers were the original scientists, actually. Yeah. And, uh, you know, hunting um, evolved into war as well. I mean, killing animals and killing people. Um, so, you know, you can see them as different archetypes or, or nobody has a handle on what's real, you know, where does one archetype end and the other one uh, begin. But um, uh, for me, I look at narrative patterns. Uh, the narrative patterns that are being lived by people and and for you know from that uh, what you know, and, and in that you can say a hunter was a warrior you know uh, 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 kind of warrior. person in the indigenous world who I think might have a handle on that I have to connect you with him four arrows is I think might that would be a fun connection I think mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so uh, okay so what's a hero and what's a hero's journey Um, I think we're all here to be heroes. Uh, I don't think they're heroes in other people. I think that there's heroes and potential heroes. So um, each of I, I do believe that the new paradigm of the world is every one of us matters. Every one of us is here for a reason. Every one of us has something to contribute if we only knew that. So um, the becoming a hero can be can be um, recognizing that, recognizing I matter. And I bet whatever my op op opportunities in life, I better do the best I can and be of, of some use and be a positive influence in the world. It's not always that because that's a belief system that I hold and I believe is true, but not everybody does. For some people, it is a, um, it is a choice it is, is a choice not because they're a hero, because they want to become one. And uh, that can be a wanting to be special, or it can be, um, and, and that's, these two aren't mutually exclusive. It can also be a calling. I mean, uh, my call, you know, my, my superpower is I can talk easy, I can talk about archetypes and write about them. But yeah, you, you've <laughs> said that everybody can be a hero, but you still haven't said what a hero is. Ah, okay. A hero is somebody who said who um, who is not just here for themselves. A hero is a person who's willing to make courageous choices for the for the greater good of the world, or for just the other people around them. But so that it has that part that you were sort of mentioning was might have been uh, a part of of ancient life where there was a sense of connectivity with the larger world that I'm, I'm not just here for me I'm here for something bigger and uh, you know I think Campbell too has been just so beautiful a, 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 such a beautiful uh, model in talking about that in terms of you know finding your treasure and bring it back for the whole world. Or the elixir that saves yeah. the, 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 the community or the town. Of the, or the community, yeah. And that it's not just for you. It's not just for you. And, and if you do it just for you, that's just um, being, uh, <clears throat> having having goals and wanting to achieve and be somebody. It's not, it's not bad, but the hero does have to have, in my view, that quality. And we're kind of like bridging into the hero's journey now. So what is the hero's journey? Um, okay, mine, mine is really simple. You know, I don't have, uh, I, I mean, we have 12 archetypes and I can make that into that, but the hero's journey is stepping fearlessly into the world and dealing. You know, and and uh, um, as you go into the world, things are going to happen, and they are they they are your things to deal with. 
they are not something to be bitching and moaning about, although I bitch and moan and we all do, but um, the, the things that happen by synchronicity or the things that you need to deal with and grow as you deal with them. And that prepares you for what you are here, what you can best do. You get better and better at it as you, as you have the courage to keep going and um, being defeated and, and rising from that and learning and going forward to, to do better in the world. And uh, I think that's in a generic way. And that's something that there's nobody on this planet that can't do. You know, it's not, I don't have stages that they have to go through. <laughs> um, um, although I do think that uh, there is a goal of, of wholeness, of the development of as we grow and as we also encounter a lot of many other people who are uh, our guides in one way or the other, that <clears throat> it develops different qualities in us. We have to develop different qualities to deal with other people. Now in your and, book though, you get into how each archetype has different aspects of their hero's journeys. Absolutely, absolutely. It's really cool and something I've never seen anywhere else. I mean, I've, well, I've done a lot of interviews about the hero's journey. I've read a lot about it. I wrote it about it in my book. Uh, the the bottom up ang angle of it that I, I write about is you don't become, you don't go through the hero's journey alone. The only way you can become this new person, which is really what I think a hero's journey is, 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 is taking the leap to become a new, better, stronger person in some way it, and, and, and somehow helping others is mm -hmm. by connecting with others and by interacting with others. And it's that interaction that is an essential part of the process of being a hero and, and going through the hero's journey. Yeah, well, and because we all of us, these are human archetypes. So all of us have access to them, which means that if you, if, if you feel other to me, which you don't, but if you did, well, one of the questions I would have is, uh, what archetype am I distancing from and in you? And, um, and to be able to connect with you I might then need to connect with an archetype in me, that archetype in me. And, you know, and even, which could be from prior experiences like method acting, you know, I, I remember when I had that, or it can be imaginal, you know, and when we read novels or go to movies and we identify with a character, it starts to develop that in us. And, um, and yes, every one of these archetypes uh, has its has its own journey, you know the the journey of the warrior and the journey of the lover aren't the same. And, uh, and that is so cool the way you get into that. We need to take another break now, so mm -hmm. we'll be back soon. Uh, and let's just pause. My guest for the show is Carol S. Pearson. She is an educator, innovator, and consultant. She's developed new theories and models with an applied practical belt bent, building on the work of psychiatrist C.G. Young. Oh, I'm going to start that all over again. My guest for the show is Carol S. Pearson. She's an educator, innovator, and consultant. She develops new theories and models with an applied practical bent, building on the work of psychiatrist C.G. Jung, psychoanalysts James Hillman, mythologist Joseph Campbell, and other depth psychologists. She's best known as the author of The Hero Within, Six Archetypes We Live By, and her latest book is What Stories Are You Living? Discover Your Archetypes, Transform Your Life, which I think is really a, a culminating book for you, uh, which is it's just an amazing book. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it, it really pulls together so much of your previous work. It's, be mm -hmm. it's a, a beautiful work. So uh, there are so many ways to apply this knowledge about the, the hero's journey, how it applies to archetypes, to, to understanding your archetypes. I mean, 
and I, and I have so many questions about it. That's why we're going to do t two interviews. This, this is the first hour where we're almost through. Then we're going to do another hour after that. So uh, you say that the memories derive not from what actually happened, but the story we told ourselves about those events. And our stories contain our own sense of who we are and how we got that way. And it's actually living your stories in real time that you gain their gifts. And, and you know, a lot of the stuff I do on this radio show is political. Mm -hmm. And so it made, it made me wonder, are, are, are there connections between liberalism and conservatism and archetypes between open-mindedness and authoritarianism? And to me, 99% of authoritarians are people who want to be told what to do, and then you, cults and cult members. Are, are, are there any ties with that? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> um, oh. Should I start with conservatives? <laughs> start with conservatives uh, now, because I think about it all the time. Uh, I mean, the, the conservatives are typically want the world that it used to be, so that's defined um, by that. And, and they want a republic, uh, so that's ruler. Um, a republic uh, is where the you you can vote for people, but it's the powerful people that run the place. <laughs> um, but in terms of archetypes, um, the the conservative party has been a warrior party, and um, there are levels of archetypes in their expression. You know, you mentioned that you had a high uh, warrior, but your warrior is very different than what we're seeing there. And the um, the it's it's a tenets, it's authoritative um, authoritarian kind of ruler mesh mesh with the the, uh, the warrior where it's all about winning. It's about the winning the war. Uh, which means if you now. disagree with people. Well, yeah, if you disagree with people, they're the enemy. And you can do what you want to them because they're the enemy. And uh, um, it's, it's very interesting to watch. And you can lie. I mean, propaganda, you, you know, because we need to win and, and winning is it. Uh, now that's a very different, but you said that you were high in warrior and your life is very different, right? So, no, my number they have one the was potential to evolve. My yeah, I remember that. Yeah, I know, I remember that. Yeah, I know that, that was second, but when the revolutionary gets together with the warrior, it's different. Um, but my suspicion is that you're not violent and you don't want to lie. So, um, and winning is about collectively winning, not winning against some other team, other group. So uh, what, what, I'm, what I'm keeping in mind is um, it's a ruler archetype taking over possessing a party. And so, so, but, but, but you say that there are- I mean, excuse me, the warrior. But you look, yeah. at the, you're, you look for the three top archetypes. So let's say Donald Trump. Now, you sure can see the warrior archetype in him. What would you speculate would be some of the other dominant archetypes that he would be living through? He has a, a jester trickster. Um, you know, I mean, that's that's really powerful. A lot of the stuff that people love in, in rallies is he's entertaining them. And he has a background as an entertainer to him. It's all virtue, you know, it's like, um, you know, it's like a TV show. <laughs> um, you know, so, but he also, uh, you know, has a narcissistic personality disorder at the very least. So he's not coming at archetypes through a healthy, uh, healthy mode, but he actually does uh, I have read at least that he was taught as a child that there were there were winners, and there were killers, and there were losers. And uh, you know that's a very hard place to be. To that that must be a hard 
uh, set of archetypes to actually live in. Um, but there, there are those two, and there's terror. There are horrible gaps of, uh, in terms of uh, having, having any uh, of the loving archetypes or the loving expression of any of the archetypes. Or the caretaker, I would imagine, would be. You know, care, you know, caregiver, lover, really. I mean, he has, he, he's a perpetrator. Um, now, I, you, you threw out narcissism, and I, I'm very interested in that as well. Narcissism and psychopaths. Where do they fit in with the archetype picture? Well, um, First of all, they're, they're character disorders. <laughs> um, and so it's not as simple as what archetype do they fall into. But um, uh, you know, so I, I think I won't go there. But there's actually a fair amount of the negative side of the uh, idealist innocent um, has narcissism in it. Oh, how's, um, it how's that work? It's all about me. It's just, you know, I'm wonderful and perfect and it's all about me. Um, and the perpetrator, um, you know, has the sociopath. The, the main thing is the lack of, uh, lack of morality. Uh, and, and, and I'm proposing it's a lack of the heroes, <laughs> of the hero archetype overall, because it isn't there's no capacity there to care about other people. So there's no we consciousness. Yeah, it's a, it's like a consciousness that's a black hole. And what's wonderful about the book is you go into such depth into each of the archetypes and all of these different dimensions. I mean, I'm gonna go through some of that stuff with you a little bit later, but it, it's it's amazing how, how just how you do. So we're gonna wrap up in a minute the, the first part of the interview. So anything you want to say at this point now about where we are so far? Oh, well, I go back to what your question was, but what you said, you were asking about organizations. And I had said that to me, the, uh, the hero's journey was simple. It's dealing, it's being true to who you are and to making a difference in the world. Uh, while also being uh, growing and changing as you need to, to, to deal with what happens. Um, and so I think it's the same with organizations, just to get back to that point. Okay. And we've, so one, okay, I got a little bit more time. So you talk about founding or foundational stories. They, that would tie in with organizations as well as people, right? Or is it just organizations? Um, well, it's very important for organizations in terms of, uh, you know, how we came to be. People love to tell those stories. You know, it was in the garage with these people or whatever, or the founding story, you know, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness came from the Declaration of Independence. We love it. It's, it's how we were, uh, <clears throat> how we were created, but for individuals, um, a lot of people love to talk about, uh, you know, how they were born and who they were born to and what, you know, and my origin story about my family, what I came from. And couples love to talk about how they met. Uh, you know, is there the origin of the marriage? And, and, you know, a lot of really good parents talk to their kids about how wonderful it was when they were born and how every, happy everybody was. Um, all of those are, I, I, uh, that sense of, you know, and uh, it's there in religion, you all know, right. the of Eden. And we need a wrap on, on that. And my guest for this show is Carol S. Pearson. She's the author of the best-selling book, the Hero Within, Six Archetypes We Live By, and her newest book is What Stories Are You Living? Discover Your Archetypes, Transform Your Mind, and her website is carolspearson.com. And if you want to take the test that we talked about, it's storywell.com.
Okay. 